Now, the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is proving more virulent that the first, than the first, even as the country crosses the 100,000 mark for infections. According to data on the website of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, only 1,033,858 samples have been tested. The nation has recorded 102,601 confirmed cases since the first infection was recorded last year. Currently, there are 19,654 active cases. The federal government says the Nigeria's COVID-19 situation is at a very critical point as the various health facilities in the country can no longer cope with increasing cases of the deadly disease. Joining me now is the CEO Health Emergency Initiative, Pascal Achunini. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on TVC Breakfast. Thank you for having me. Now, we have just uh, collected samples of about one, over one million, according to the reports uh, by the NCDC. And we are already saying that uh, with the way the cases are rising, uh, that uh, we, may not, we may run out of uh, the capacity health-wise, uh, uh, that in talking about uh, the health hospitals and every form of facility to handle the rising number of cases. And we have just tested over a million. How grim a picture is this? Yeah, it's apprehensive. Um, it's scary. Mm. And uh, it, for those who know, uh, there are, um, so many are anxious and scared uh, because uh, systemic preparation seems to be weak. And okay. then there's also disinformation and knowledge gap. Over 60% of the population do not connect with the second wave. And uh, the second wave, beyond whatever, however it is expressed in technical terms, it means that the coronavirus that we had some time ago has come back in a very ferocious form. Uh, it's so dangerous that you see some persons who may be asymptomatic and by the time it, they, it hits them very hard, in less than two days, they die. Mm. Now, what have we done as a country to deal with this? Because leadership requires that you must confront an enemy like coronavirus. Absolutely. And that is where I'd like for you to, you know, expatiate on. You yes. said systemic preparation is weak. Yes. Where did we get it wrong? And when you say systemic preparation, how do you mean? Just paint us a picture. So, yeah. let's start from the number of uh, persons tested. Um, it's a little above 1 million, mm. a population of 200 million. Over 200. Of over 200 million. And um, uh, this is about uh, 10 months this virus came here. So one of the key areas I figure out that government ought to have done much more is, besides the PCR test, there could have been deployment of uh, rapid tests across nooks and crannies. Because uh, even as I speak to you, it's possible that you may struggle to, in case you want to go and test, where will you go and conduct a test? So the, what we have tested is abysmally low compared to what this, the country has capacity to do. And I see that there isn't enough coordination. If you check the National Youth Service, they conducted two orientation camps recently. Feelers I got was that they deployed the rapid test form mechanism, yeah. Yeah. and most of the people who tested positive, a few of them that tested positive, they went for the PCR test. It's valid. It was validated. So that process that needs to be activated, so that people who may not have cap funding to go to private labs where they pay fifty thousand or more, or people who do not know how to accelerate the access to some of the government testing locations, they can have access to a test, and mm. that reduces the chances of death. Because sometimes the persons who call me and report that I lost this person, I lost this person. Sometimes I'm wondering whether the number we had there is a reflection of it. Yeah. Secondly, we had isolation centers, and they were taken down uh, when we felt that the number has reduced. <clears throat> like yesterday, we ought to have restored all those f structures, including the surveillance, unit, uh, surveillance team that was constituted, that was conducting tracing. So these things are not in place. And most importantly, is communication. People still, when over 60% of the population still feel that it's a, it's, are indifferent, let me not even say that it's a scam. 
from what some people say, but they are indifferent to this. And that can be, ref you can see it reflecting in our markets, in our parks, uh, on the streets. People, most 90% of the places you go, you see people not wearing nose masks. You see people not observing the protocols. And it behoves leadership mm. to integrate effective communication, effective monitoring, effective surveillance, and also do a few things that show that you care for the people. When you say effective now, you would recall that uh, during the first wave, the, the government tried to enforce, and you saw the level of resistance first, and then uh, sharp practices that, that were introduced in the process, especially when people were said not to, there shouldn't be interstate travel, but certain persons were being given monies, according to reports, and people were moving around. And we also had the issues with, okay, ensuring that, okay, you observe, stay at home, and it was difficult. And then we began to see people move around, and then we had the security issues. If we are saying effectiveness, if we want to get that effectiveness, how should government go about it such that people will, you know, work hand in hand with the government and we can achieve the results that I, we're I'm looking I'm glad for. you use hand in hand because um, governance is not done in isolation of those who are in political offices or those who are in civil service or public office. It is, uh, it, it is built around consensus collaboration. You must identify that you need the private sector and private sector collaboration goes beyond Kakovi or some other partners donating money. Some are doing it to be politically correct. Right. It must be, I you also work, I've mentioned private sector, but social sector, because there were many sec social sector players that were involved in the uh, various interventions during the first wave. Mm. And their programs trickle down to the people. So if government uh, goes it alone, if it's a solo engagement, because this in, in, involves the lives of people. Because we are not seeing much of that in the second wave, yeah, so, as we speak. Yeah, so the, the private sector, the public, social sector, and government must work together, and government must take the lead. Government must identify who we are the key partners, who supported various, there are many ways, channels of getting that information. And they can buttress, they can amplify what the government have been saying so that people can listen and feel that, oh, there is a common enemy. Because the truth about COVID-19 is not malaria, it's not like non-communicable diseases. This one, you, you will see someone looking hella hearty. In 14, in five days, the person is no more. So we need to work with the government, but the government must take the lead. Is the government not taking the lead as we speak? Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot to be done in the area of coordination. There's a lot to be done in the area of consistency because you see a government, it, there are certain things that give people some uh, doubt about it, like the registration, NIN registration. People feel that if the government is very co uh, co genuine about this, this is not the best time to continue with this program. Why not shelve it until this whole thing blows over? Or perhaps makes the process seamless, where Sim people can do it from their, the comfort of their home. Yeah, for those who have capacity. But because even if we declare that uh, you, as a government, that you can, you, everybody must do this, even without COVID-19, mm -hmm. can, we can ramp up in the next three months. Why not shelve that? Well, that's one of the ways that shows that government listings. That's one of the ways that shows people who say, oh, they, they listen to this complaint and they acted positively. Then there are also some incentives and you provide because many businesses have collapsed between the last um, wave and now. So, so government must demonstrate a lot more sincerity in the way it cares for its citizens. People will start believing and people will get more involved. And again, you won't be talking about complying with the protocols when there is no power born water. There is no genuine measures taken to sink boreholes. We are talking about schools yeah. resuming. When the schools resume, especially public schools, even the universities, how many of them have functional water? How many of the hostels are structured in such a way that they can take, uh, 30 years ago when I was in the university, we were eight in one room, a small apartment. Some sleep on the floor, so two of us uh, sleep in three, bed, uh, um, three and a half beds. Mm. Um, three, three and a half inches bed. So has it improved thereafter? It has gotten worse. So even when we are t contemplating opening schools, I will consider all these vari variables. So there must be demonstration of sincerity, commitment, and engagement. That, and when one official of the government speaks concerning this, 
there must be coordination that somebody does not, another official shell of the government says something that con does not contradict that. So it's very critical. Now, now that uh, it's seeming like we are, we are running out of capacity to, you know, handle this uh, pandemic, the second wave, I can perhaps you spoke about uh, private sector. Look, let's look at uh, hospitals, private hospitals. Can can the government now begin to look? at that collaboration will that help would that go a long way absolutely because when the uh, when the first wave came there were no private labs involved but government profiled some labs and saw that they had capacity to conduct tests and they certified them there are hospitals that have credible structures that can complement what the government is doing because um the picture in uh, I, we saw a documentary that uh, your organization yes. ran, ran recently at uh, the uh, infection disease center, and we could see that there isn't even enough space to accommodate. We don't have enough oxygen. Enough oxygen. Mm -hmm. So we are getting to that stage. We've already we are already in that stage. Only that it was the, the comment was being conservative from the side of the government. So this is the best time to in identify more private hospitals, give them guidelines. There are, are thresholds you must maintain in terms of quality assurance. And then integrate a man E. You must monitor to ensure that nobody is moving away from pre prescribed guidelines. But it's very critical that uh, we don't get this get to a stage where we are seeing dead bodies on the street. Hmm. Uh, because again, you talked about what is the outlook. Many who traveled during the holidays, especially those who traveled outside oh, Lagos and those who came in from uh, many threw caution to the wind. So we are beginning to feel much of it. You see persons, they feel they had malaria, but the, the next two, three days, they say, oh, this thing is more than malaria. And some got, got as bad as dying, uh, some of them. Instantly. Yeah, we've had a lot of professors who died in the last uh, 10 days or two weeks. And we don't want to be losing such precious talent. Because it's not, this thing does not discriminate about whether it's a poor person or a or rich not. person. We, that's why we must. Again, one of the key things that is so painful is that when COVID-19 hit us early last year, we did not think about building a robust transformational program for our health system. We are still treating things ad hoc. So there must be a, a think tank. There must be a strategic move by the government aided by the private sector. I, uh, the, uh, Aliko Dangote last time said, Every private organization, sex tested organization, must commit 1% of its profits to health. I don't know when we start thinking seriously about it, but health is wealth. Absolutely, from what we are seeing going on across the world right now. One more thing I'd like for you to have on, the aspect of people taking responsibility, because it seems a lot of us do not understand that our actions affect the next person, especially our loved ones, stemming from how the COVID-19 is spreading? So I, that, I want to especially appeal to those who are misleading others that this is a scam. Please take it serious because I, we have seen records of persons outside the country who took similar posture and they were among those who got infected and died. Secondly, the government does not regulate your everyday activity. activity. You have a right to stay alive. And this God has, those in political office will come and go, but you must take steps, wear your nose mask, wash your hands, use hand sanitizers, non-essential movement, avoid it, and stay alive. And I, Health Emergency Initiative is also available to provide the similar support we gave last time to give PPE to organizations. We can support any, all right. Uh, partnership in that regards. Thank uh, you. CEO Health Emergency Initiative, Pascal Ajunini, thank you for your time on the program. It's my pleasure.